Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you'd like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere. There's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Speaking of Patreon, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Bo Snail, Justin Duso, Joseph Pizarro, Samson, Maris, Harry Blade, Mobile Max 777, Neo the One, Lost Cat FE, Rob W Open Minded, Reese Pound, Del West Watson, Mike Muted, Dick Earth Skeptic, Chris Hillman, and a Literalist. Maria Neelands, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, Rob H, Nathan Thompson, The Real Gabster, Wind Rider, Liam Nedrick, Owen Jenisons, Abraham Mohammed, Dave Rakia Gafford, Nyby, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic936, Life is Short, Fireball X, Felix Hung, Texas Mike, Edwin Johnson, Kirsten Smith, Alexander Main, David Wayne Foster, and Dank. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. I'll raise the mic on whoever is in Discord. And you can enjoy their conversation while I set up for today's live show and hopefully get a conversation going on Google Meet. It doesn't actually, does it show me who's in? It just says Flat Zoid and One Moyle and Neil. It but shows Neil, yeah, and yourself. That's all it shows about me. Show me a list of people who's in this call, though, does it? Oh, there we go. It does, but it's just a bit of a mess. I do that up a bit. Yeah, it's okay. I'll get used to it. any different in there is it just seems very similar to google hangouts on air to me am i wrong it's like google hangouts to me but i can see we can share screen and everything so it might be better green what some of these buttons do green well that does yeah it's uh yeah i can add oh, well, people I share screen yeah just go and raise my hand, <laughs> like Skype. Oh, here we go. So I can actually show you and, uh, okay. Mm. <laughs> okay. Oh, there we go. That's how you get it back. Hmm. I'm sure this is very riveting for my audience. Have we heard Neil speak yet? Neil, can you hear us? I can hear you there on Discord, but I can't hear you in the other one. Let me go back. You can still hear me, right, Flatsoid? I want to make sure. Yeah, hundred percent. Fine, it's a problem with you, Neil. That's not my concern. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll figure it out. It's fine. It's fine for now. If we're talking at all, I'll hear you on the other hangout. Just drop and rejoin. Or to go in and set your mic up. So you need to go into the cog at the bottom right of meat and set up what needs setting up, maybe. Yeah, I did. I got the mic on. It doesn't give you an option for the speaker, but I still can't hear if I hold it to my ear. Let me see. Let me go back. Is flat so I'd get in through? Yeah, flat side's getting everything fine. Which is weird. Usually I'm the one struggling. Oh. 
I'm happy with this. <clears throat> Works fine. I must say, it sounds sounds much more crisp to me. It does, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, very clear. That's not necessarily a good thing. Now, I've got to admit, everybody, it's, it's asking me to, like, allow them to join. That's a pain, isn't it? But it's good, though. You'll know if some troll joins, if someone adds them. I suppose Hello. So. Hello, hey, Ten. It's not he. You got a cold? Okay, I'm back. Yeah, I'm got to come back. Oh, <laughs> Neil's here. It's it's all sorted. We can all we can all yeah. calm down. Conspiracy's over. Neil made it on. That's the most important thing. <laughs> Neil <laughs> has the problems always. Yeah, I've got a I got a cold from the kids, so I don't want to sniffle. I'll be on mute most of the time. Sure, it's a cold. Yeah, it's a cold. You don't got the Coriolis? I have six grand. <laughs> I guess. Well, I do have I do have the Coriolis in the sense that I took them all in my truck and gave them a ride, and they all had sniffling noses, and then I got it. <laughs> so self-induced truck Coriolis. Yeah, they're losing their mind over here. They're saying if you see your neighbor and there's more cars than usual, or if there's an SUV. You know, there's more than five people in the SUV. You need to call the authorities. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're gaslighting uh, Shapil Americans into a much kinder, easier communism. <laughs> I'm joke. moving to England. No, it's no better there. Satan has no worries. I mean, I have no worries. I'm doing a GoFundMe campaign at the moment. No worries. <laughs> I wouldn't be e-begging to do a bit of acoustic treatment if I had no worries. Well, I don't mean in that way. I mean, you don't let the, the local news and all that other stuff, you don't pay attention to that. Well, you can turn uh, your TV every, off. Every country's got it their problems, off. believe me. You just don't just don't watch the TV. That's not like having no worries. It's <laughs> it's, it's cheaper to move to England than turn down to your TV or turn it off, I guess. <laughs> well, if I have I to. always wanted to visit England. I always wanted to go to Liverpool. Because the Beatles are my favorite group. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, it is fantastic here. We are basically ace. There's no doubt about it. Well, if my brother moves to, well, yeah. if my brother moves to Ireland next year, which it should be a February, then I'll shoot the visit of it. Then I'll see if I can pop by Nathan sometime. I dated this girl one time, and she wasn't impressed with the skyline. She was like, "This doesn't have anything on in on London." Uh, fair enough. What's the what's your, the what's the skyline there? What do you got, London Bridge, and is it like a city? Me, I'm in Leamington, so Shakespeare's country. Warwickshire, not not London. I'm saying London has you know the Big Ben, like, right? right? Yes, obviously I've gone and seen Big Ben. They got oh, you, London bridges. Bridges. You've been to Pittsburgh? You've seen Big Ben? <laughs> Big Ben, Roethlisberger. <laughs> that part in uh, vacation cracks me up. There goes Big Ben. <laughs> They keep going around in circles. There goes Big Ben. We got stuck there uh, traveling from Spain back to America during 9-11 for 10 days, I think, when uh, they, they shut down international flights. And so we stayed in Chiswick. And uh, my favorite part was the Imperial War Museum because I'm a World War II buff. So, But we went everywhere and... Uh, yeah, it's nice. It's worth a visit. Hey, Nathan, where did they film that scene in, um, what do you call that movie, uh, American Werewolf in London, at the end, where he breaks through the, the, the Rated X theater? Okay, yeah. Are you familiar with that? Yes, vaguely. I have seen American Werewolf in, uh, in London. What about it? That part where they shot that scene, was it called Piccadilly Circus Circuit? Right. I mean, that's not impressive. Piccadilly Circus. 
just I, I could just name a hundred different American locations with big billboards and flashing lights that looks infinitely more impressive than Piccadilly Circus. I mean, Vegas, generally, anywhere in Vegas. Oh, I wasn't talking about impressions. I just wanted to know what that, if you know where that was shot. Yeah, I know where Piccadilly Circus is. That scene. Yeah. Is that where it shot, Piccadilly Circus? I can't remember. It's been 10 years since I watched that film. It's a new one. It would make sense. It's a very, you know, obvious landmark. But I just remember the bit where it's where it gets where he gets tagged at the beginning, right? It's on the moors. Stay off the moors. <laughs> Stick to the road. Stick to the road. <laughs> Stay off the moors. <laughs> yeah, but he should have listened to his man. He said, "Slaughtered lamb." What kind of place is this? He didn't want to go. Uh, why would you go in a place called the slaughtered lamb? Yeah, that's fairly common. <laughs> Obviously, if you're <laughs> in a community Americans, that's right? well. Everybody eats lamb. It's got to be slaughtered. Well, they don't. That's just another way of saying, don't go out on the limb. <laughs> hey, don't go out on the lamb. Don't limb. go out on the lamb. <laughs> well, well, in the mob, when you go out on the lamb, it's to hide out. And that's the only time you're allowed to grow a beard. Right. Most of uh, the impressions of London, especially, but England as well, is from the old black and white Sherlock Holmes movies. That I have. All righty then. I skipped a few generations there. Indeed. <laughs> My dear Dr. Watson. <laughs> anyway, I watched a Will Farrell movie called Holmes and Watson. It was terrible. I mean, it was truly, truly awful. What, what was it called? Called Holmes and Watson. Recent movie, okay. maybe in the last year. Oh, so, so he, he was playing a part in it? Well, it was just a terrible, a terrible Holmes movie. It was just appalling. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, it's amazing how you can screw up a remake, especially when a script's already been written and you can watch how it was done ten times over, and then you still screw it up. <laughs> they did it as a comedy, and it wasn't funny. No, I see. Did you get a chance to watch that uh, video that Adam linked on the thermodynamics guy? No, not yet. The guy that's a, he's actually a Glober, right? But he's yeah. pulling apart Professor Dave. Yeah, he is. He's like several above. Well, I was in multiple levels above Professor Dave and his understanding and studies. And he just rips Professor Dave. <laughs> he's still a Glober, but he rips him apart pretty good. But right. he just talks about how you can't. The part that I liked, and I still haven't watched the whole thing, but the part that got me was when he said, How's it here on Earth with natural laws? And I'm ad libbing here. Uh, we have classical thermodynamics and you say uh it doesn't apply for something out there when we just you know basically what we do we, we discovered it here on earth but you say it doesn't apply to, out there he has that kind of a uh argument with professor dave when he's uh, rebutting one of the answers of thermodynamics and the sun and the gases and blah 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 i see it's just cool because i said well, i just Oh, is he listening to Nathan Oakley or what? What's going on here? Who is this guy? <laughs> Not going to get around the thermodynamic laws as much as the fundies on the globe side want to just deny them. Yeah, I mean, I you keep it simple too. Natural laws, natural law. It is what it is. We don't put it through the scientific method. It is. I mean, what are you going to do? It's always happening. Yeah, but I think I think what what I'm hearing a lot lately is people are saying that that doesn't mean it's the same up there. That's what they're standing by. Called a special pleading fallacy.
what a lovely day. Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live. There's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel. So please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. One last time, if you're new to the channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. Now we are joined by 10th man, Neil, uh, Flatsoid, and I think that's it, other than a whole bunch of people in Discord. So welcome one and all. Good yo, morning, yo, everybody. Yo, yo, yo. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, morning. So I did do a test stream this morning, uh, along with a, a plug for my GoFundMe campaign. Why not? If I'm going to test the live stream, I might have something to promote. And that was my GoFundMe campaign. I will put a link below the info box if you do want to check it out. It's about my studio treatment. Fascinating. I'm sure that is to absolutely everybody watching. However, it seems to be the case that this stream now runs okay. So I'm hoping there won't be any issues as there were yesterday with the two live shows that I tried to produce and they just didn't work. Um, <clears throat> hopefully OBS will behave itself throughout the whole of this live show. Nevertheless, we're now up and running again with something new, which is Google Meet, which is where the current live panel are going to be situated. And that's the internal panel as opposed to the Discord server where you would join if you were a member of the public. So hope everyone's comfy and happy in Google Meet. You're all right in there? Yeah, a couple of moves different, but you can get here and still work it. Exactly. It's fine. It's good enough. <laughs> it does the job. Any evidence? No problems for me. Perfect. Everyone's happy. Any evidence of a physical, geometric, sphere edge horizon, formerly known as Earth curvature? Not from Google Meet. <laughs> South Africa's flat. Yeah, not from anywhere. Not from Google Meet. Not from Hangouts on Air. <laughs> Out well, with the old, in with the new. That's what I say. All hail Google Meet. Google Hangouts was rubbish anyway. Any evidence of axial rotation of the Earth-based variety? Absolutely not. That's why in navigation, they tell you to imagine that the Earth is stationary and the stars are moving. Why would they say that? Because that's Why how it looks. It it, that is challenge. apparent. That is how it looks. Yes. Well, if you've ever flown in a plane before, you will know you're flying over a stationary plane. It would be very, very difficult if you were trying to catch the Earth or underneath you. Or not trying to catch it because it will be much different than how we fly today. Did you say airplane? There's a reason it's called an airplane. Because it's flying over a plane? Stationary plane. Yes. That's the name of my chat, the song that goes along with the channel. If you come along to Nathan Oakley 980 and you're not subscribed, it automatically plays a song that was made for me by the very beautiful, beautiful Be Here and Love. And it's called We Live on a Stationary Plane. That's what plays if you're not subscribed. Any evidence of the distance to the sun? No. No evidence for that, for sure. No evidence. Mic check. Hey, Paul. Yep. That, that's something I'll have to sort Ever out. As soon as Paul joined, it went bling blong. Now all the, the audience <laughs> didn't see what I saw with all the little flashing. And Paul wants to join. It's like, maybe that's a security added measure. So obviously, if you just see a random name, you won't let them in. But by the same token, I just want you to be able to join. So I'm sure I can figure that out in settings at a later date. But hello, Paul. Good to have you. Bing bong. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. <laughs> And any evidence? Hey, any evidence that Paul joined? Bling belong. <laughs> okay, with the sun, have they scientifically validated that it's even a tangible object yet? It isn't a tangible object. 
So how would you know the distance? The light in the sky, and they don't know the distance. I remember uh, back in the day, it was 3 million. Then it went a little higher. Now it's somewhere at 93 million. They keep guessing. Any scientific evidence of gravity? No. They see things falling down, and they reify it into a force that's not a force. And they now... So well, that's it. Yeah, they think taking relative density that is scientifically validated and just having an assumption that the ground is pulling it towards the ground is now gravity somehow. Even though it's not time bending space, it's just conceptual, they still want to keep it as a force. So it's very confusing. Any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? Not yet. Sorry, what's a hypothesis? I don't think they understand. Scientific prediction. It establishes your dependent variable, the phenomena you're studying, your independent variable, that would be what you assume causes the effect, any control variables, and is formatted with an alternative, that would be if A, then B, if independent variable, that which will vary, then B, your dependent variable, phenomena being studies and also a null if a not b if varied won't cause the effect that's what a hypothesis is it's an empirical method of establishing what you've actually got as a phenomena what you're going to vary when you do your experiment and an end result that regardless of which it's going to be you'll validate one or the other null or alternative will be validated at the end of a systematic experimentation part of the scientific method so a hypothesis is a scientific prediction then uh, absolutely and if you not can't they sit there and look at pictures and, and if you can't vary so the independent variable then what can't vary the independent variable then it's not a variable because you can't vary it Exactly. Why'd you ask? So you can't science it then? You can't what? Can you repeat that? Then you can't u use the scientific method on that, on that question. Which question? Well, whatever question they pose. No, they often can't formulate within the scientific method. If you're talking about astrophysicists for the sake of argument, they've just got just so stories. They might even have plenty of phenomena to study, but they're never going to formulate an actual scientific prediction capable of validation with experiment. That's beyond them. They're, they're all pseudoscientists. That's just it. Any, any experimentation is, is not possible. It's not that it's not possible. If you, if you say the appearance of a, a light in the sky, that would be a star to you and I. That's a phenomena, right? Wouldn't you agree? Look, a light appeared in that gap of blue sky when it went black. Well, that, you can say, is a dependent variable. Something that's occurring. A phenomena. Well, are you saying that you couldn't assume the cause of it and then vary that cause to see if it caused it or not? Of course you could. Now, the good, there's a good chance that you'll vary it. That would be vary your independent variable, and it won't cause the effect. But that's absolutely fine. You know, you'll still validate your null, which is to say it's something else to rule out your presumed cause of whatever is the effect that you're studying. In this case, a star appearing. Well, that's, that's definitely not beyond the capabilities of an astrophysicist. Not at all. They can definitely not even ask him for the experiment. Just a valid hypothesis. What do you think causes this phenomena you study? If it's the stars, that's a phenomena. What's your independent variable? What do you think causes that? Hello, Elijah and Chocolate. Good morning, guys. Good morning, good morning. Mic check. You guys hear me? 
yes, and we clear, do. clearer and better leveled up than Skype and G plus hey. combined. It's sounding good. I've got to admit, the G plus panel is now known Meet hang, Hangouts. What's it called? Meet panel. What do I call it? Meet sounds. Meet Google Meet. Yeah, Google Meet. Meet. <laughs> it's just a bit, a bit Viking, <laughs> isn't it? I I got a pause for that star, Nathan. Got a pause. Maths. Maths. Maths is the cause for that star. Maths is an abstract description of things. It's, it's not going to cause anything. Describing something mathematically, then, it's not causing it. But then why are they using maths to just to figure out their causes for everything? Yes, it's like looking at a piece of music. Not the music, is it? It's not the sound reaching your ears. It's not the feeling you get when something's connected with emotionally not the same thing writing something down and describing something verbalizing something describing what a rock is isn't a rock mathematical descriptions are just that abstract any evidence of a self-perpetuating molten iron core at the center of a presupposed spherical earth definite no Couple of newbies in Discord. Chad, any evidence of a molten iron core? About the R value. Any evidence of the R value? Earth radius? Don't be shy. Come on, don't make us say no again. Come in with. Proof of radius, man. Oh, come on. Okay. Should, should be simple. Nine. <laughs> Nine. <laughs> okay. Any evidence you can, you can have gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container to press upon? Would anybody be kind enough to explain antecedents to the Globers? Because they think it's, it's, it means assumption. It means requirement. The antecedent for a uh, filet mignon is a cow. You can't have filet mignon without a cow. So if you see filet mignon, you don't need to see the cow, which has been slaughtered. It's already gone. You just know there was a cow at some stage for you to have it. It's an antecedent. You can't have filet mignon without a cow. And you can't have gas pressure without a container. If the sky was a vacuum, the gas we breathe would fill the space. And you can't be on Google Meets without raising the sticks. Oh, my Meat. God. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, but with the vegetarians today, there's a way that they could make a filet mignon just like they make veggie burgers. Like a broccoli filet mignon or something? Man? Like, that's not filet mignon. <laughs> you can't have a... Like... No, that's fine. You can't have a veggie burger. Without the necessary antecedent of veggies, you need the vegetables first, right? And if you say, oh, you can have it synthetic, well, that's not veggie burger anymore. Not got any veg. So the antecedent to a veggie burger is Wait. vegetables, just like the antecedent uh, to... Go on. I'm, I'm confused, Flat Soul. You said they don't know the meaning of antecedent. But I remember a global coming in here and trying to use that word against us and saying the antecedent to ships disappearing... Uh, bottom up is the curve of the earth. <laughs> so I remember that. Yeah. So apparently, some of them think that antecedent actually means what it means, as opposed to as an assumption. I see. So because they assume that an optical effect of things getting too small to see is actually the reified physical geometric sphere at horizon blocking a boat or a building into the distance, they call that assumption an antecedent. And therefore, when we use the word antecedent correctly to describe an actual requirement to have something, I mean, it's easy to defy us, right? We say you can't have gas pressure without a container. It's a necessary antecedent. Well, antecedent, necessary antecedent. It's one of the things required, right? Well, it's fine for you to violate that by demonstration. And the way to do it is to show gas pressure without a container. 
That's how you prove that wrong. Oh, you say it's not an antecedent, just an assumption that you must have a container. Well, then show us not having a container. If it's not a must, antecedent, must, must have it, then show us it without. Easy, right? Uh, just for clarity, don't point at the sky and assume that these pictures that show you a black area claim to be a vacuum is what's above your head. So you can't just point at the sky and say, I assume that's a vacuum, and obviously the gas isn't filling it, therefore that proves it. That's special pleading. Meanwhile, uh, for things disappearing bottom up, you can have that before things even meet the horizon. So they're wrong there, as far as antecedents go. The number of reasons that things are obscured well, not to mention different from obstructed, by the way. Yeah, but they know that because they come in with lists of things that oh, flat earthers say are the reasons that ships disappear bottom up. <laughs> right? Get the words out of my mouth. Yeah, who came up with that list? The words out of chocolate. Mouth. Are they saying flat earthers are the antecedent now? No, that he's saying that there's a list <laughs> of things that they would say have. Uh, justified the excuse for Earth Curve, which is their only thing in their list. There's Earth Curve in one column, and uh, you know, you've got limitations based on angular resolution. You've got the foreshortening of you over the ground and the angle to your target. You've got uh, conditions on the day, swells, perspective. All of these things are listed in a massive list of Flat Earthers' excuse for Earth Curve. Because the only thing in their mathematics that causes things to disappear bottom up is a physical reification of their horizon into a sphere edge. It's the only cause, according to them. Well, I just want to know how the word antecedent made it into everyone's dictionary, if it's not a thing. If it's not a word that actually describes something. I'm looking at it here. It says, going before, proceeding, one that precedes another. Indeed. You've got to have it first. You can't have gas pressure without first having containment for the gas pressure to press upon. It goes before, yeah, tough you man, require it. Tough, tough man, get out of here with your definitions of words and stuff. Like, words mean things. <laughs> yeah, you, the words. one doesn't follow the other. So you don't have first filet mignon or veggie burger and then the vegetables. The one is following the other. So first you have vegetables, then you have a veggie burger. First you have a cow, then you have filet mignon. First you have a container, then you can have gas pressure. Have you, have you not realized all this antecedents is actual physical things? Not yeah. conceptual? Yeah, not, not conceptual. Not Well, you can't have gas pressure next to a vacuum without gravity! <laughs> no, no. It's got to be something actual. Well, that concludes the housekeeping. At least we got all the way through it without a wow, crash. Wow, that was quick. I haven't actually checked. Is everything running, functioning fine on YouTube? Can you just let me know from the live stream chat if everything's okay? Hopefully so. Any more confirmed cases of the Coriolis virus? <laughs> Every day. You would, you would think it would, it would, you know, some more cases would have popped up being that, you know, Neil smoking the grass Tyson over here came out and reiterated his point that the earth is rotating underneath footballs and stuff. So, I don't know. Well, uh, Chocolate, apparently the, apparently the people on my channel are telling me that it's not what he meant. He didn't mean Earth is rotating underneath the ball. We just don't understand. Oh, oh Mr. Astrophysicist, Neil Smoking the Grass Tyson can't explain his own words. We need these clowns to tell us what he is saying. Okay. No. Are you saying, <laughs> are you saying he doubled down after uh, that yes. WS website? <laughs> fight, no, no, no. fight, fight, fight. It's not it's not doubling down though with NDT, right? That's just globe rhetoric. The problem with the just globe rhetoric that Neil deGrasse Tyson's parroting out to somebody who's on his side on TV is that it's really really easy to debunk. Now, because of that, they have to say no no no, he's, you don't quite understand what he means. What he means is you're never going to see 15 degrees an hour drift as earth turns underneath anything including a football like he's describing. 
because we don't see that. So therefore, you must be misunderstanding what he's saying. <laughs> They're saying what happened was. <laughs> well, you, but you, clouds. you might as well. That's a good point, Nathan, because you might as well apply that globe rhetoric to everything, because whatever they say can't be seen or proven. Yeah. Geometric horizon only exists in the maths. Earth turning underneath at 15 degrees an hour to cause drift? You don't understand. It doesn't drift. We wouldn't see any effect. They deny their own claims. It's just doublespeak in the most literal sense of the word. Tell us how we see things drifting apart as Earth turns underneath a football, only to tell us that we don't understand Earth's not turning underneath footballs because, like you say, that would shorten flight times and it doesn't. So obviously Earth's not turning under Neil deGrasse Tyson's football. But that's not that... I, the globe head in this example, am debunking Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's just you, the flat earther, that doesn't understand. The earth doesn't turn under the football like he's saying it does. You don't get that. We do. It would just shorten flight times if it was actually the case that earth turned underneath the football like Neil deGrasse Tyson is asserting. So you have to deny that if you're a globe head coming here and explain how we don't understand it. <laughs> this is the same Neil deGrasse Tyson that I saw in the video of. Uh, in being interviewed by a guy and they, it was a big glass window behind them like in a tall story building and he's telling this guy that the earth is rotating at a thousand miles per hour but we can't feel it but it's happening and then he then talks about how the football felt it when it went up off the ground <laughs> it's too funny man adam hello can you hear me? Yay! There we go. All very nice and shiny and slick, Nathan. Yeah. Right, right. It's been a lot of work. New yeah. hotness, I think, is the phrase. <laughs> yes. Hey, sir. Adam. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's okay. Nice new guys. At least it's functioning. At least people can watch. At least it's not crashing. Yeah. Did you see I tested it earlier? Maybe not. It's a good layout, though, to be honest. Ah. It's pretty. It's okay. Yeah, it's called... Uh... Adam, it's called Google and it's Meet. Actual. Adam, it's called Google Meet, so don't butcher it up. <laughs> oh, I really don't like the name. A massive well, thanks. This is a saucy show. My outro is now going to be a massive thanks to the Discord and Meet panel. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> you, no, well, Nathan, you, you should say thanks for the saucy show. <laughs> I don't want to make a hash now, of this. Nathan. Now, Nathan, you can rib us and get away with it. Where's the beef? Where's the beef? Just, Stop just it, put a fork in it. Got some rumblings. Was that from Discord? Hopefully a conversation will turn up about actual flat earth and globe earth related subjects. We'll see. But in the meantime, yeah, meat is good. Well done. <laughs> well, it is kind of rare for globes to show up. <laughs> it is. Get a lot of moaning. I get loads of comments about um, Mr. Sensible. Now, I'm not a Mr. Sensible fan. I'm not subscribed to Mr. Sensible. I don't watch Mr. Sensible or care about Mr. Sensible. However, he cares a lot about what I think about his mage claim. Now, as far as I'm concerned, based only on what I've heard from the commenters about what it's claiming, we debunked it 1st Jan 2020 by debunking a physical geometric sphere edge for a horizon, which is what it's making an observation of. Further to that, claims that you've got a pressure up there that's lower proves we've got pressure so what is it proving exactly nevertheless the commenters still seem to be coming here saying you're invited to debunk this it's like i've already debunked this black swan debunked it if you're claiming you can see a physical horizon in this then we've debunked that the horizon's not a physical geometric sphere edge if you want to take the it's lower pressure up there and extrapolate out that into a being a sky vacuum again we'll just pummel that based on its violation of the second law of thermodynamics nothing's changed but yeah it's like what do you think i should go out chasing him to debunk this stuff when i couldn't give a crap about him or what he produces he, he only cares what i think for some oh, reason he's really concerned about oh, me debunking it all he did was prove a flat stationary earth i mean he proved entropy he proved barrel distortion he proved that they can't put a line straight over a lens and he proved how gullible the globe is off as easy as that he didn't I show any any proof I, I, was, globe whatsoever. I was in the chat feed with you, Nathan, on one of your shows, and he jumped in there and 
he kept saying, I dare you or challenge you to watch my mage claim and put links and like you, I don't follow that guy, but what's he going to do after the black swan? I don't even know what the mage claim is. Me neither. That's what I keep saying. I'm like, he's welcome to join or run a public show. It's got a public link. He can come in and tell us all about it if he wanted to. But if it proves something, he'd have done that already. He'd be rubbing it right in our faces. Now, the fact that we've debunked it from chat comments is the reason he's not here. Now, maybe he can, I don't know, engineer a situation where he can gain the upper hand so he can put his information across in some manner that makes it seem like he's got a win. He hasn't. All of it's based on him assuming the horizon's a sphere edge. Okay, we've debunked that. We're told by you, the globe-believing fundies, how it's only in existence in your maths. How we wouldn't expect to see it. But what, we do expect to see it in mage images? <laughs> You've got a massive problem with the black swan. But I mean... But I mean, isn't Mr. Sensible the same guy that said, at best you've debunked our radius? And yeah, debunking our radius, you're not going to have a curve. Yeah, the reason he stated, quote, at best you've debunked the radius, you would have... De Start again. Don't want to paraphrase. Quote, at best you would have debunked the radius. Well, the reason he said that is because based on a physical assumption of sphere edge horizon, you derive your R value. And if you can't see a physical geometric sphere edge horizon, you can't derive an R value with it being a tangent point. Now, when that was explained to him by Mitchell from Australia, his concession was to say, well, based on that, at best, you would have debunked the radius. Well, yeah, based on not being able to see a physical sphere edge for a horizon as explained to you, to give that concession. But yet, what, you send a balloon up or wherever... I'm, I don't even know what mage is. Is it a balloon? I've no idea, literally. Anybody know what it is? Is it just a balloon? I don't know. No idea. Yeah, huh? because he's not been presented. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was just, yeah, it was just a high, high balloon, but if he's got the balls to come and talk about it, we'll be more than happy to answer anything he asks. Is he going to tell us? Look at this horizon. Yeah, Look how bent it is. <laughs> Look how the pressure's still here but lower. I extrapolate my fundamentalist religious sky vacuum belief from that. Obviously, the higher you go, it goes to zero. No, because it would all vacate in line with entropy law. So, no, that's just your fundy belief. Nothing being proven. Other than a reification of the sphere edge, he's declared a lack thereof would debunk the radius value, imploding the entire model... What, step a few steps back and just assume the horizon's an edge again? No! <laughs> Useless! Uh, I think he's trying to, to... I think he probably wishes some of his time back because he said that, like, out the gate. As far as I know, he was pretty new in this when he said that. But I think if it if it happened now, like, he would never say that. Like, yeah, what, I don't think he, he realized how devastating that, that, that concession was at the time. <laughs> That's what probably I still doesn't it, like all nonchalant, like it was okay. Yeah, he... that he avoids it with all. I you recognize the logic today. Yes, the logic, the logic is sound. It was explained to him. He understood it and could digest it as a reasonably competent human being. So he processed it and came to the conclusion that we have come to that you can't see a geometric sphere edge as declared by their own side. Therefore, it's not a tangent point. Therefore, you can't measure it. Therefore, you can't derive R from it, as he conceded. But the concession's based on not having a physical sphere edge. Tangent point. Refracted, right? Yeah? Well, you're all eating your own words now, because if it's refracted, you haven't got a straight line to it, and it's not a tangent point anymore, as your maths requires. <laughs> so it's just a joke. What? Show us a horizon. We'll just laugh at you. And whisper black swan in your ear as we walk away laughing. You can see why he won't come into the meat rooms now. It's just too much at stake if he loses. Ah, oh, boom, boom. Just out of interest, did Earth turn underneath the... Uh, <laughs> nice one. Did Earth turn underneath the mage balloon at 15 degrees an hour like Earth turned underneath Neil deGrasse football? Uh-oh. Maybe you can answer that. That's the question I've got. If you've sent a balloon up, we've just recently had Neil deGrasse Dyson disclaiming that balls will drift from the stands because you're turning underneath them when they leave the grass. Well, obviously, your balloon left the grass, didn't it? It entered what's claimed to be an inertial reference frame. And it's claimed we observe Coriolis deviation as stuff 
drifts away as we turn underneath on a spinning Earth. So did you observe this Coriolis effect in your balloon? Because it should definitely be there, according to Neil deGrasse Tyson. What's that I hear? We wouldn't expect to see the drift. Alert to Coriolis virus people. No drift under the balloon. And the only explanation will be a declaration that they've contracted the Coriolis virus. No drift. We wouldn't expect Earth to turn underneath the balloon like it turned underneath Neil deGrasse Tyson's football. Why would you ever think that? Well, because you were telling us about it and Neil deGrasse Tyson tells us about it and you're supposed to have Coriolis drift on a turning Earth. Why would you be telling us that we wouldn't expect to see it under your balloon? Maybe he'll tell us we did. Maybe it ended in a different country, 15 degrees away an hour later. I think it's an issue of logic and cognitive dissonance because they have this globe religion. They don't want to give it up. So when you say when a hot air balloon goes up with a few passengers, which I have here in wine country, I see them all the time up in the sky and the earth underneath is moving at 15 degrees. Uh, at my latitude here, according to them, it should be about 860 miles per hour. Well, that Earth should be moving th exactly that same amount under that hot air balloon. And Neil deGrasse comes and says, if you were to play football next to 10th man's uh, you know, property and the ball goes in the air, the Earth should move under the football 860 miles per hour as well. That's the degrees converted, right? Yeah, if you take it from the angular speed or and translate it to a mile per hour speed is going to be based on their claim that obviously it increases as you get further towards or closer towards the equator so if you're saying that you've calculated out your latitude to be 800 miles an hour i'll just take i'll take your word for it i haven't done the maths but yeah based on their presupposition of a spinning earth at 15 degrees an hour you can translate that to a mile per hour speed that earth is turning underneath things not attached and right. don't forget that and don't forget that's closer to the surface the higher you go up the velocity has to change as well so you can have to spin faster to keep up with you Right, so the logic that they should have, say, hey, you know what? If the football leaves the ground and the earth turns underneath the football, then anything that leaves the ground, the earth should turn underneath. But they, they skip that conveniently because it's a death to their globe religion. And they say, well, that's not what it means. Yeah, they tell us that we don't understand what they've just told us which is 15 degrees an hour turn of the earth underneath things not attached like footballs. And you go, right, so turn of the earth underneath things not attached like footballs. What about snipers? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you shoot a gun and you've obviously got to account for the fact that after the gun's left the fixed frame of you turning underneath, then the earth's going to turn underneath and you've got to account for that. All right, so earth's turning underneath footballs and earth's turning underneath a sniper's bullet. What about gyros? Do they drift because Earth's turning underneath them in their cage? Do you see it deviate? Oh, yeah. Gyros definitely drift at 15 degrees an hour as Earth turns underneath them. So Earth's turning underneath gyros. What about pendulums? Oh, definitely Earth turns underneath pendulums at 15 degrees an hour. It turns underneath snipers' bullets at 15 degrees an hour. And you can even achieve a field goal because Earth's turning underneath at 15 degrees an hour. Things not attached. Right, right, I see. So you launch a drone on the equator... And Earth turns underneath it at 1,000 miles an hour then. Oh, no, it's got engines. Well, but that makes no difference. Coriolis is me observing it seem to drift away. It's nothing to do with it flying away a 1,000 miles an hour. Drones can't do that. But it's claimed we would turn underneath it at a 1,000 miles an hour, though, isn't it? Like we turn underneath the bullet and underneath the ball and underneath the pendulum and underneath the gyro and underneath the drone and underneath the hot air balloon. And underneath Mage. And underneath an aeroplane. And a helicopter. And a blimp. Or you if you jump up and down. And Earth would turn underneath you at 15 degrees an hour. What's that? We wouldn't expect to see drift. Oh, right. Coriolis virus strikes again. Tell us all about how things have got deflection because Earth's turning underneath us. Only for us to point out that that would shorten flight times. And have hot air balloons landing in a different country and drones whizzing away from you a thousand miles an hour on the equator. All things that don't happen. And you tell us, why would you ever suggest that we would see things drifting away? Why would you, Flat Earther, think the Earth turns underneath? Uh, we don't. You do. 
It just doesn't happen. Beautiful. Back to reality. Can we share screens here? Yes, you can. Yes. How do we do that? I don't There's know. There's three but little that's, dots that in the bottom. If you press the so share screen. Sounds very much like after show pre show stuff. <laughs> well, no, it is to show. It was just to show you. I've got the mage picture up. Um, interesting. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, I'm down with that. If you can. Where are we? Turn it. on captions. Change full screen. That's I don't know. Full, no, that's just that full screen. I need to oh. share my my background stuff. So. I can't see it. I can't see. We'll figure it screen. out. Oh. It works the I'll same as Hangouts in. worked, as far as I could tell. It's the exact same procedure. Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Live, ladies and gentlemen. This is how exciting it gets here. I'm not even kidding. It's like this daily. <laughs> well, it would be different if they would actually come challenge something. I don't even know if there's any Globers in there. Any Globers in the uh, Discord server? We're not going to ha harass you for answers or anything. I just want to know if there are actually any opposing side members here. We wouldn't oh, we expect got, to see. We got to be all nice. We got to be like, we won't destroy you. Just say hi, guys. Hi. Chocolate. Chocolate. We wouldn't <laughs> expect to see any globe members on us. <laughs> Why would you expect to see globe members? <laughs> I've hustled everyone off mute, so just say hello if you're a globe believer. Really the case? We've got no Globe Believers on today. There's a gap on the panel. So if someone wants to join this Globe Believer, feel free. Maybe they're all in self-quarantine due to the Coriolis virus. I would want to detach myself from anybody that might necessarily put me in a position where I have to deny the claim we are 15 degrees an hour, turn of the earth underneath stuff not attached as a Globe Believer. That would be a painful position to have to put yourself into. So yeah, very wise, very wise. Oh. What, what was the circumstance that he had to come out and reiterate it again? Was he just talking about that, that scenario, that game, or, like, has anybody actually seen it? I haven't seen it. No it idea what you're talking about. It was a show that Nathan did, and I went in and posted a comment about how nothing they say actually exists or something to that effect, that he jumped on that chat and kept sending people links to his mage thing. No, I'm not talking about Mr. Sensible. I'm talking oh. about uh, smoking the grass, Tyson. Oh, have you not seen the, the latest from him being interviewed and just basically rattling off his explanation for Earth turning underneath and then moving on to hurricanes? Have you not seen that? It's on the my new, The on newest my one? No. Chalk. So there's a couple of places. Yeah, it's on my video, Nathan. Chalk. Yeah, it's, right, on, okay. it's on Flatsoy's channel. It's also on Anders Ace's channel. Yeah, an interesting side note on the Coriolis effect, if anyone's yeah. interested, you can stop me if it's completely off ball. But um, apparently they say that Jupiter is a big spinning ball of gas and um, on Jupiter there's hurricanes or uh, cyclones. And uh, the big red dot is apparently a, you know, caused by spinning of Jupiter. Uh, they actually say that it's an anticyclone, which is... Uh, the opposite to what you would expect if it was a spinning ball of gas. So, uh, it's uh, just an interesting tidbit there I found out. Anyone interested? That's cool. Even though you can't have gas in a vacuum. Yeah, beyond the second law of, beyond the violation. No, no, I mean, that, to, to, to me, it's, it's evidence that whatever Jupiter is, it is not a spinning ball of gas. <laughs> because if it was, and it would have the Coriolis effect. And the Coriolis effect would make the, the red dot go the other way. No, it wouldn't. So it, no, it wouldn't. So there isn't. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't. Right, let me just explain. The Coriolis effect is only ever observable from the spinning frame of reference. So, for the sake of argument, for this to be a Coriolis effect, you would be inside the eye of the storm that is the anticyclonic eye of jupiter as you observed something that's not spinning seem to drift because you're spinning that's coriolis now while they convolute this not actual drift that's you observing something seem to drift only because you're turning beneath it into 
an actual rotational effect caused and observed while you're effectively standing still. Well, it's not. That's a nonsense. Same goes for water going down toilets or drains. It makes absolutely no sense to describe that as a Coriolis deviation unless you're in the water, spinning around, watching things seem to move. Look at the light as I spin round down the drain. It looks like it's moving when it's not. That would be Coriolis effect. But you watching something spin as you're not doing anything isn't Coriolis effect. That's an actual spin direction versus Coriolis effect, which is a not actual deflection because you're turning beneath but just to summarize the only way to have Coriolis is if you're turning underneath stuff so for earth to have Coriolis effect we must be observing stuff as we turn under it right Adam are you still sharing I was muted yes yeah it's it's there don't Nathan. Um, Your screen is well, I've still... just, just quickly looked at it, and I assume they've tried to get something with a horizon there. Uh, can you see that now? Can. Yeah. So I've, if you look at it, it looks like an optical track. I mean, first of all, any curvature in that appears to be not optical, uh, as in what you look at, because the, the curve seems to start higher up and bend down. But... I figured it's just like one of those tricks of the eye. So I've just put up a curtain rod on my screen. And it's a 32-inch screen. And that, that that's that's straight. That line across there, across the screen, literally, other than the last inch and a half of my screen either side, it's there where it starts to bend at the edges of the camera. So it's flat in the middle. But if you go to the middle, you can put a straight line across that white to blue at the horizon point, and it's straight. So... The only curvature occurs at the extremities of the, the camera. And they, they're boasting this is a flat camera. And it is flat in the middle. Uh, but right at the edges, you can see the, the slight kinking. Um, but if it was supposedly showing curvature, then what you would expect to see is even fall away left and right, not a complete straight line, then a small drop at the edge of frame which is all you're getting, straight line, straight through the 95% of the image and 5% drop up at the end, it looks like. Okay. And what are we measuring now? Is this... Well, exactly. Uh, is this... Um, is it the horizon we're referring to, right? Yeah. yeah and what's that then? The... What's the horizon? Exactly. But not um, exactly. Just tell me, what is it? Well, it's an apparent position. What's apparent mean? Well, well, not actual. Not... Um, actual location so it's not a physical point that you could call a tangent the edge of a sphere no no you can't draw a straight line to it either because they say the all lines to bent uh, to it are bent correct yep so it's a not actual location non-physical location cannot be described as a tangent point or you don't have a straight line to it so to describe how it's bending with barrel distortion that's lens distortion is kind of irrelevant really wouldn't you agree Boy. If it did, even if it did show some bending, that bending would be irrelevant, yes, in terms of any validity to it, because it's all subject to refraction. But um, whilst it is subject to refraction, uh, the, the image appears to be rendering uh, a flat horizon, as always. <laughs> um, I see. Uh, yeah, the bottom line here is the, the horizon's not a physical geometric sphere edge horizon. It's a not actual location therefore irrelevant when it comes to making claims mm -hmm. of geometry which is all they do in the geometric physical sphere edge horizon earth curve mathematics yes nathan you're right ah oh, thanks guys <laughs> it's nice to know we have such uh, camaraderie <laughs> I was I was I was just trying to analyze it with a little bit of ball head on there. If 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 I was Johnny Globehead, could I use that to justify my religious beliefs? And well, yeah, we can destroy it. I'm just saying, not looking at it, even if as Johnny Globehead, I can't. I mean, I've got to listen to what Neil the, the High Priest says up there, 
that stuff is flat even at that height. So you know that there's another priest. source. There's another source um, for this guy that did a presentation on Aristosthenes. Now, I didn't watch the whole video, but I have the timestamp of the portion of that presentation where he goes into why they wouldn't see curvature, not even at the ISS. He even says flat earthers are right up until that point. Would you guys like me to share it? You can, but it's the same point, isn't it? When he says curvature, what's he referring to? A physical geometric sphere edge horizon, formerly known as the curve of the Earth, only existing in their maths. Is that what he's saying you wouldn't expect to see curving at a given altitude? Because who cares? Yep. Basically, that's the magic trick. Um, as much as, yeah, you can if you want to, you feel free to present it and play it, but uh, there's no point. Understanding that the magic trick starts, ends, and has even been defined recently when detailing how to attack flat earthers in debate on this subject, it all starts with the horizon. Beyond that, it's just about gathering trust like the fundy cult members that the globe are. They've got to gather our trust and then tell us about how the horizon's a physical sphere edge blocking boats and buildings. We see the magic show. They want us to argue all day long about whether or not it should be bent at altitude, it being a physical reified horizon earth curve edge. And we debunked it. It's not. At best, you would have debunked the radius, Mr. Sensible. Well, that's because we don't have a physical tangent point to measure anymore. Yeah, and it's not really a but. But I guess it is a but. Um, I, it, what the guy is saying is that we would never experience curvature at all because even from the iss like it, everything that we have other than the satellites that are in the vacuum of space which hasn't been proven and is nonsensical everything up until the point of the iss you would never have experienced curvature so all of these lives that they have where they're like oh look the earth is curving it's not the case even on to say that they um use optical equipment that's deceptive so I think that that's, you know... What, double speak? given that they've got a physical earth curve mathematics calculator, begging the question proof of nothing, perspective hijacking earth curve calculator that says precisely how much they say a physical reified earth curve edge will block boats and buildings, i.e. how much you can measure it just with a common photograph from the ground. So according to them, you can see it. They've got a calculator to measure it, yet they double speak around not seeing it. And what is it? Because that's really what this is all about, arguing about it. And it is the horizon. How much we'd see of it bending? Well, they're claiming you can measure that from the ground. Wouldn't see it, can measure it from the ground. Makes no sense. We just don't have a physical sphere edge for a horizon. That's the bottom line. Yeah, that's, that's true. It's all just fantasy land. All designed to make us argue within certain parameters. Do we argue about whether or not the sky could be a vacuum? No, 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 definitely not. Argue about whether or not rockets would work in the vacuum, so then we're all assuming there's a vacuum. And then everyone on the globe side's happy. Do we argue about... Yeah, that's why I like your... Go on. That's why I like your... Sorry. That's why I like your argument about Narnia. Why are you fighting about the lamppost inside Narnia when Narnia doesn't exist in the first instance? Exactly. It's, argue about whether rockets it's would work. It's a waste of time. Why, why, why argue about whether rockets would work in a vacuum? What vacuum? Sky is not a vacuum. What's that you assume it is and then we're going to argue about your assumption on whether or not rockets would work in it? Like arguing about whether the gas lamp would work in Narnia. Who cares if the gas lamp works in Narnia? What about the physics of the gas lamp? What about the time dilation on the back gas burning? Who cares? It's not a real place. And space is fake. You can't have gas pressure that we're all breathing if the sky is a vacuum. It would fill the space. And what do they call that space for gas to fill if it was real? Oh, they call it space. Irony of irony. And yet they want us to argue about the fake place and how it works rather than whether or not it actually exists. And the same applies for Earth Curve. Let's argue all day about whether or not we'd see a bend in the horizon at altitude when the horizon's not a physical location. It's not got boats falling over the edge of it. It's not the edge of your globe. 
And that's why we have to be charged with justifying a flat earth society model with boats literally falling over a pizza. Because in the globe model, they've got boats going over a physical geometric sphere edge. A horizon they've reified into physicality. And we haven't got a physical horizon. The horizon's not physical. And as soon as you say that to anybody well, with half a brain, well, they know instinctively that that's the case. You know the horizon's not an actual location. You can't get to it. You can't call it a tangent point. It's not physically obstructing anything. Oh, I've been joined by QE. Welcome, Quantum Eraser. Appears you trimmed the fat. Oh, Google Meet. Another another joke about meat. Well, if you... Go, Brian, go. Hey, John. Go flat side. Well, anyway, like I was saying, if you take a container and you have and you have a certain amount of gas in that container, if you enlarge the container, the gas would still fill the available presentative, correct? Gas will fill the space, yeah. Based on so what you were saying before, say it feels like we should have almost just... It's just enlarging our containment of Earth, so all the gas would increase and gas would fill it. Well, no, that would change the rate. Proportional to time, right? <laughs> well, if you've got a much, much, much bigger space for the gas to fill, the entropy increase will be quicker. Rapid. Based on what you were saying before, it's almost like we, we should have just pointed out the definition of horizon to them, like, years ago. Like, <laughs> maybe take an extra look at that word apparent, right? So that they could understand, like, how, how are these ships going over so it's an not apparent actual. position? No, <laughs> it's not actual. It's, it's kind of a shame that it's taken <laughs> this long to realize that, like... Because, I mean, where, where are the globe heads with the, uh, the curve calculator? Where's that at? <laughs> Where's the, 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 There's 10 feet of this boat missing. Where's that? Oh, we left that argument alone now? We don't do that no more? Why? Because that the horizon is a, not a physical place anymore, guys. That is a damn shame. This is, <laughs> this is terrible. It's sad. And this is something we Come recognized. Yeah, well, chocolate, you forget when they read. Gone, gone. Sorry, you can go on. I was going to say... The... I was saying, you forget, when they do read citations, they don't actually know what they're reading in the first instance. Yeah, you're right. They do want to debate about definitions of words like and. <laughs> so, And when they provide citations, it actually says imaginary and fictitious. Yeah, Andrew Thomas Young will take a line of sight to the geometric horizon and then we'll appreciate in the next paragraph that we can't see it so we're drawing a line of sight that means you can see it to something that you cannot see you can't see the geometric horizon it's not a sphere edge i mean we did recognize this pre-black swan don't forget no i was just going to say prior to the don't black swan when, also... when it came to neil degrasse tyson pointing out that you should have a physical sphere edge or not have a physical sphere edge compared to a reified bouncy ball version of the earth as a sphere i remember distinctly saying you know flat, uh, i think it was red pill philosophy who came out and was like look neil degrasse tyson saying that stuff is flat it's like no what he's saying is you need to understand that the horizon's physical in his magic trick so that we can all decide whether or not it's going to bend or not bend at altitude and i'm saying it's not bent with its physical attributes like this bouncy ball and its edge i'm comparing to the horizon on a globe earth now obviously he's not saying that in the magic trick but pre-black swan we recognize that obviously it's not a physical location we already knew that what the black swan did was take their actual argument to the point where they have to tell us that it's not physical that's the genius of the black swan they're telling us how physical it isn't <laughs> right <laughs> To quote unorthodox, oh, did you guys forget, did you forget about optics, Nathan? <laughs> it's just our argument. Did you forget about geometry and a yeah, tangent point forget, needed? Uh, Andrew Thomas Young also said that they did the test over a flat plane. Yeah, their reified yeah. version of refraction seven over six r isn't something you can measure in reality. 
you know, light isn't subject to a curve of the Earth with a radius value and 7 over 6 of it. That's just maths in their geometry. But they then start using that refracted maths to derive a point that they need as a physical geometric tangent point. That would be the horizon. They say blocks of boats and buildings, right? Yeah, it's screwed. And they have to tell us how screwed it is when they say things like, we wouldn't expect to see a geometric horizon. The geometric horizon only exists in the maths. Well, oh, okay. We knew that. Yeah, yeah. Your earth curve maths is nothing more than a reification fallacy. Nothing to do with the horizon, which isn't physical. It's it's pretty slick how that works, right? They'll talk about refraction. Too many of things the light. you shouldn't they'll expect talk to about, see. They'll talk about the light all day. And then as soon as they go to refraction, and they, with their 7, and six, seven over 6 R, that they just slip that R right in there. Oh, but you're not talking about the light anymore. Now you're talking about the Earth, the radius of the Earth. Well, that's not light refracting. That's your radius. <laughs> well, you're not even talking about the same thing. It's ridiculous. Yeah, but how, how, haven't you realized everything they see as actual evidence is based on something you cannot see? It's all... You have. That's exactly correct. So they're drawing a line of sight to the geometric horizon and then justifying how you can't see that line of sight. Well, if you can't see it, you don't have a line of sight to it. It doesn't exist. You can't say, well, based on an assumption that it does exist, and I do have a tangent point and it is physical, I'm going to use that value of R that I've derived from this assumption that the horizon's physical when it isn't to give me a value that I can move the actual location to a not physical location, not that it ever was physical in the first place, to say that I can measure it by way of the assumption and the back engineering of the R value that I use to derive it when I can't see it. It's a bit of a mess. With that, I'll say if you're watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Premiering Streams, then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. There is also a link in the information box below to a GoFundMe campaign that I'm currently running to finish off the acoustic treatment in this studio. So check that out. It's in the link in the info box below the video. Massive thank you to today's Meet and Discord panel for making today's live show possible. Once again, stay tuned if you're watching on either Premiering Stream. I've been Nathan Oakley and I'll see you all in the next video. Yes, yeah, off the show now. Yeah, I'll let Maria. Well, we got Eli here. Eli can sing his ass off, so. <laughs> you guys can play it, it's quite good. I'll let Marie listen to it, Chocolate, as they were walking the dog. Um, yeah. I absolutely loved it. She's just, I like, I, and she, she did say, and that Spurs, he's a bit grimy, isn't he? He's a bit grimy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> grimy? Grimy means London. That's an outrage, right? London grime is not Spurs. Spurs is from <laughs> Birmingham, which is not London grime at all. Not at all. <laughs> I think a bit gr would, would grimy. Would grimy be that. like, it would be like the opposite of like posh. Is that <laughs> like how you guys use it over there? Slurs. Nice. Slurs. <laughs> Adam got me going on grimy rap. <laughs> I, I want to get Tenth Man drop a few bars. <laughs> That'll never happen. <laughs> it's cool. There's a lot of creative people in it. Obviously, you wouldn't expect Flat Earth to suddenly spur a load of musical talent, but it has, which is cool. We could we could even hit those flat notes really well. <laughs>
Hey, Chocolate, in the middle of your next one, you got to have Tenth Man's Muttley laugh in there. I, I use his laugh for, for my intro, my last one, bro. Are you kidding? <laughs> what? Oh, what a way to start I wouldn't go as far as to say talent. Oh, I know. Wow. Hey. <laughs> Listen to this guy. Sounds like envy. Right? Right, Neil? There's a little whiff of that in the air. Hmm. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. I don't want to be rude, Chocolate, but I think you'll find me and, me and John were the trailblazers, the pioneers, you might say, of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, admittedly, there was a lot less talent in mine. Um, <laughs> it was <laughs> daft enough to do it, but... I think you'll find uh, Dubai. I, I had to take it to the hip hop angle. Uh, so. I think you'll find Dubai beat you all to it. Ooh. You, Eric Dubai beat you all to this. Oh. He was way ahead of the curve. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> what? That's a fact. Credit where credit's due. What did he say? Is he rapping? Yeah. He sing? I, I remember him making some type of music, but I don't remember what he was doing. Yeah, man. Who's rapping? I think he makes psychedelic music. Yeah, yeah just man. Made a rap. It had to be flat. Just made a flat earth rap. And he was, like I say, well before all of you lot. I know you can't quite believe it. Credit's being given to Eric DeBay. No, well, that's cool, man. So that's the, but that's the old and busted. This is the new hotness. <laughs> oh, I see. So immediately <laughs> well, Eric DeBay's baby. attempts were old and busted. <laughs> okay. You can't enjoy the new school if you don't, you know, you can't recognize the old school. So, you know, it's 2020, <laughs> it's a new era. <laughs> uh, no, nah, man, shout out to Eric DeBay. Yeah, let's get back yeah. onto the subject we were just talking about. What were you saying? Something about envy or jealousy? I forget. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. John. In seriousness, you know, shout out to Eric DeBay. Got to listen to some old Jimi Hendrix. He's got a lot of stuff you can rap to. Ballers. Yeah, that's uh, the ballers are afraid to come to the show now it's pretty clear over the last few weeks oh there's definitely some ballers in the after show we'll see I would think you that... come on if you were on the other side of this argument well let me finish what i'm saying i've been noticing if you, that if your pod... answer was going to be irrelevant all the time sure uh, can you not have the a conversation co over him go ahead 10th <laughs> the, <laughs> the cognitive dissonance is just pounding in their head the having multiple thoughts at the same time is just pounding in their head. So they just can't come on there. Every argument's been addressed. Every argument has been stripped down word by word, beaten up, delivered to them with a kind word. And sometimes not such a kind word because they had home to begin with. And then next thing you know, I can't go on that show. My head hurts. <laughs> uh, I, Addressed I, 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 and stripped down. I think it's, uh, it's the new format. They are ballers. They're scared to come into the meat room and talk their usual tripe. Oh, <laughs> nice one. Nice one. The Adam Meekin. His tenth, he inspires you. <laughs> you know, at the point in the day, I think of puns all the time. <laughs> well, I got well, that because I'm Italian. We know about tripe. Well, Nathan's got the best line now. He's going to tear a strip off of them. Oh, boom, boom. No, I'm not. I'm actually going to do a quick shout out. So somebody's actually hit my GoFundMe campaign. So Rob Hunston, shout out to you, my friend. Massive thank you for supporting my GoFundMe campaign. Just noticed while I was uh, fiddling around in the background. Thank you very much. Give us a give you a chance for a plug there, then, Nate, because I don't know it. What what's this one? What have we got for? Oh, it's a very modest one. It's not going to be a big campaign. It's I think I'm asking. I can't remember what I put it. I think it was five hundred. Maybe it was six hundred. Anyway, not a great deal. So for the last nine months, I've been treating my room. I'm sure you have heard me talking about treating the <laughs> studio, right? 
Yeah. No, absolutely not. Tell us more about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's this treating you speak of? Uh, so I've been treating the room <laughs> acoustically, and I've ba- basically been working to a set plan. You can. The, the amazing thing about acoustic treatment is that the people involved are really humble people, and they're more than willing to just offer up all of their information for nothing. And I don't expect anything back in return. And I think it's because it's such a small industry. They can't really be backbiting and, you know, anti-competitive or any of that sort of thing. They've got to just be forthright, tell you what what's what, and sort of cut through the charlatanism that is in some way involved in the industry. Um, but anyway, it means that there, there's a one of the tools available was this thing called AMROC. It's a room mode calculator. You plug in your room dimensions. You say, what do you want to treat for? So you can treat all the way up to professional studios that are, that are at mixing level, in which case like 100% of the room is covered. And you can pick anything in between from that to just somebody who wants to listen to a bit of music. Now, I just set it to speech or voice. I forget what the category was called. Looked at the requirements, worked out the coefficients. It pretty much gives it you all anyway, and then set about doing it. And I'm now 80% there. But the order that I did it was based on this guy called Yesco. So the guy's got a channel called Acoustics Insider. And while a lot of the acousticians will show their wonderful way of measuring it with complicated mics and software like Room EQ Wizard, this guy was like, nah, don't do that. You won't know how to interpret it. If you just stick a mic in a room, measure it, you're not going to be able to interpret the results and say, this is what I should do. So just here's your basic plan. Go forth doing that. And once you're mostly there, you can then start measuring. So that's what I've done. Anyway, it doesn't change the fact that I pretty much knew what I'd got to get anyway. And then (laughs) I've over nine months been buying one or two panels from a, a, a company that actually physically makes them and has done so during the lockdown. So at the beginning of the process, I was like, I want to buy more stuff from local manufacturers and not just order stuff on Amazon, like maybe upgrade the mic with my Patreon funds or maybe upgrade the camera. And you just go on Amazon, right? And you just order whatever's the cheapest. And if you don't like it, you send it back, all that convenience. I didn't want that. I wanted to go to somebody who's physically going to be making something while we're locked down, i.e. a manufacturing process that's still taking place while the lockdown's going on. And that ended up being GIK Acoustics and getting them to physically make panels. Now, could I make them? Well, probably badly with a lot more time and they'd end up being a lot worse. But for maybe £100 at a time or £200 at a time, you know, from my Patreon funds, I've kept putting the money in each month to to slowly treat the room. Nine months later, number one, I'm a bit sick of it. Number two, (laughs) my alternator went. So today after this broadcasting, I have to hand over 500 quid to to a garage for fitting a new one, which I know will put a halt to treating the studio. Now I do. I want to get it done, and I want to move on to other things. I don't want to stop, especially as we are actually locked down at the moment. Um, doing what I've been doing month on month on month, which is just putting a little bit more into uh, somebody who's me making something, somebody who's keeping people employed and keeping food on their table that's working from the UK. Um, I want to do it this month as well as I did last month, and I can't because of other things I've had to pay for, which is just you know that's unfortunate. But by the same token, I do want to keep the process going as I have. Yeah, tried so hard to do so up until now um, with Patreon funds. So I just want to you know, buy maybe one panel and that'll keep me happy. I'll be like, no, throughout the whole of the COVID lockdown, I still managed to inject a bit of money into a, a company that was keeping people in the UK working and making stuff. And that to me, I mean, like most people probably don't give a crap, but for me, that seems like something I can actually do proactively. Yeah, people go out and they protest and people moan about the things they don't like about the law changes. That isn't me. Me, I think, well, how can I actually affect some individuals at ground level with what I've got? Well, I've got a little bit of money in my pocket each month from Patreon, and I can actually buy a th- a, an item, a thing, that someone's going to have to take their hands and graft to make, put it in the post, arrange for a transaction to occur, get the people in the postage service to actually physically bring it to me, keeping them working. You know, it's just a little thing to keep it going, and I want to do that and get it finished as well so unfortunately this month that's beyond my means and i don't want that to stop it from occurring and i don't want the process of treating this room to finish i do want it to actually be you know at the concludatory point where i can say no i've done every step in the process i've done all of the things it said it should do and it does react the way i wanted it to i've finished now i can move on to other things so there you go that's why i've set up a little gofundme campaign just to clear a little bit of debt that i've got from paypal credit which i accumulated to get 
a bit of money off postage as much as I'm saying I want to inject money. I haggled like hell every time I ordered anything. I bet they hate me. I'm probably one of the worst customers you could have ever um, because I, I know what it's like to sell stuff and therefore I know how to buy. And that makes me a pure pain in the ass for anybody who deals with me. But still, you know, I've given them money and, and I've continued to do so and I hope to continue to do so till the project's actually finished rather than, it, oh, it's a bit too expensive this month and it's just stopping. Uh, I just don't want that to happen. I want to actually get to the end. I want to make a proper nice shiny video about it and go, look, this is a finished studio. This is what it cost a lot. Uh, this is how long it took a long time and this is the process that it took me to get there. And here's the result. And just show one one measured graph. Go on, whoever that is. I'm done. That was me enough waffling about GoFundMe. Support my GoFundMe. I'm done. Whoever was making a load of noise on their mic. Started off as a short shout out and ended up being a long, prolonged plug for Adam. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. I'm not ratting myself out. Oh, it was, it was Neil causing it. I'd finished anyway. I was just explaining why I've done a GoFundMe, a little one this time for, for clearing debt when I thought I'd normally pay it off and order another panel. Well, you know, 500 quid has prevented that. Not that anyone would care if I was like, I need a new alternator as a GoFundMe. I don't think that would go over at all. That'd be a good Kickstarter, though. Boom, boom. <laughs> I'm going on that pun. I'm off to walk the dog before Kemp <laughs> picks my brains. Like, G gents, I'll see you later. It's a <laughs> pleasure. Thank you for joining, Adam, as always. See you, mate. Take care. See you there, Adam. Thanks, guys. Plus, I think it's beneficial so to the audience, just to round this out, because I'll stop talking about acoustic treatment and everyone will be really happy with that, right? Well, I was going to say, now that you gave us the short version, tell us the long version. <laughs> for the long version, become a Patreon because I've published nothing but for the last nine months. And that's another thing. It will help my Patreons who probably at this point are like, oh, wonderful, a new Patreon video about an acoustic panel. What a shock. <laughs> I'm sure it sounds good to your Patreons. Well, at the end of the day, it all helps, right? Because if he goes back to some of the older, like, real older episodes, like, the sound is so much different, so much more different. Like, it's so much better now. So whatever you're doing, keep it up. Well, one thing one thing I know about Nathan is that he's an aficionado when it comes to this part of his equipment and show because he's worked in the industry and he understands it and he wants to put out a good show. So... Uh, I mean, we're all learning stuff that we would never even consider if, if we were running a YouTube channel. Well, it is directly related to that, actually, Chocolate. So when I'm listening to you speak now, there's certain things that I can apply, there's certain compressors I can apply, limiters that I can apply. And when I applied them back in the day, or attempted to, the result was always bad. And the reason is simple, because what I'm monitoring has got a load of room noise in it. So you can't really tell whether or not what you've done to the sound has actually improved it until you go back after the fact and monitor it on the recording or play the recording back through the system that you're monitoring it on while you're live. So to get around that, the only thing you can do is try and remove the noise of the room so that what I'm actually hearing of you represents accurately what you actually sound like. So if it's all scratchy and distorted or over compressed or whatever, I can hear it and, and actually adjust it. Now, it might be a tiny adjustment, but often that will make a massive difference to the legibility of what you're saying rather than a load of crackling and distortion. That's going to be the case because often I can't control certain aspects that are coming from your end. But what I can do is make tweaks at this end that actually now make a difference to how legible or, um, what's the word, how clear the audio is to the audience. It's not just affecting me and what goes into my mic. What I hear of you and what I adjust based on what I hear of you in this room now directly affects how the sound comes out to the audience. So, yeah, th that's why I've kept doing it. It's hard to explain that to somebody when they just see a picture of a panel and they're like, so you're making it sound better in your room then, who cares? It's like, no, it doesn't quite work like that. For me to make realistic adjustments, I need to actually hear how it's sounding. And you don't if it's all bouncing around the room and there's a load of reverberation and the decay's hanging around forever. You don't know what you're adjusting. No, so I you definitely you hear the difference. hit a button like I do. Say again, Neil. 
I'm saying you don't, you just don't got to hit the button like I do and talk. Wow. No, there's I'm actually about... work involved. Yeah, there's a lot of work involved. Yes, I do this all day from the moment I wake up till the moment I go to sleep, Neil. <laughs> this is my job. <laughs> it's all I think about it's and do. So easy. All we gotta do is hit a button. Yes, from your side of the from your side of the mic, it's very easy, you know. But if you listen back to the show and you notice that you know you're crackling every time you talk, there's a good chance you're just too close to your mic. I'm not saying you, Neil. I'm just saying anybody who's who's on the panel, listen back and think, well, what can I do to try and prevent that at my end? Because often you overloading your own mic. There's nothing I can do about that. Yeah, sometimes I've listened to all the episodes and I'm like, wow, I sound horrible. And I'm sure that's a combination of because of the, the microphone that I had, because at times I had like a Bluetooth or something. And then I'm always at work, so there's always background noise and, you know, wh whatever system you had back then. So, like, you listen to it now and it's such a difference. It's crazy. I agree. Yeah, just being able to apply plugins effectively know how they're doing, what they're doing, and why they're making a difference, because I can hear it when I do it, as opposed to you do it, turn it on, and you go, okay, well, I kind of think it sounds better. And then you go back to the recording after it's finished and go, my God, it sounds awful. And it's because you couldn't tell what you were doing when you were doing it, which is a nightmare. But that's what, that's what a studio's for, right? That's the whole purpose of a studio. And taking the debate seriously taking what i do on youtube seriously means i a, want to be able to hear what everyone's saying better and b want the audience to hear what people are saying better and the only way to do that is to have a proper studio and unfortunately for me that's really 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 expensive but i'm nearly there <laughs> so enough about my gofundme so so do you think by going on google meets people can be heard better Heard. Oh, dear God, these are getting worse. <laughs> well, look, in the absence of ballers, come on. Where are Please, you? we need globe proofies. <laughs> I had to think about that one for a second, but I got it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, they're not going to. They're not going to comment. I mean, at the moment, they're completely screwed. They've got Earth turning underneath a football, according to Neil deGrasse Tyson. While they need to come here and tell us how Earth doesn't turn underneath pendulums and stuff. It's great. <laughs> Yeah, it's embarrassing to be a baller, especially on a show that strips you down every time. I mean, I, I, I can't believe they were coming at the rate they were in the past. It was like, you're getting beat up every time you come in here. Why do you come in here? Well, the problem, Nathan, is you're too stupid to understand scientific arguments and you're a science denier ah. and a reality denier. Wow. That's the problem. If you don't Speaking understand of, uh, what the arguments are being presented to, you've got a problem, you can dismiss them. You just simply go on the grounds, you don't understand, therefore it's not right. Unfortunately, so Rampa, the rest of us get on Rampa. with the high-technology high world and move on and learn stuff, leaving you in our, tr in our wake in, the, in, a, in an environment of ignorance and stupidity. Nervous. Why are you sound so nervous, Rumpus? Rumpus, Rumpus, you're get dying. Nervous at all. Hang on, Rumpus, is Earth turning Well, I'm about, no, I'm about to be muted, airplane. I suppose. That might, I have to, I can only get about four or five words before being over-talked or muted, so I, I've got to get my words out. Okay, I'm, I'm being very nice and slow with you. So, is Earth turning underneath airplanes? The motion of an aeroplane with regard to the Earth's surface I'm not is talking determined about by its velocity. Now, let's, listen, the try, see, you can't understand. Try listening. The, the rate at which the move, there's a movement between an aeroplane and the Earth is determined by the aeroplane's velocity. That before you go there, you before you go there, on. is Earth turning as you give your example? Does Earth turn as you give your example? Earth is rotating all the time, yes, but so is the aeroplane. Well, then there's no Coriolis okay. deflection at 15 degrees an hour. If they're both rotating at the same rate, then Neil deGrasse was wrong then. So Earth doesn't turn underneath a football at 15 degrees an hour to cause it deflect and go through a goal then. Any of the issues you're talking about. But did, so, why did you start talking through me when I was in the middle of making my example, Rumpus? Is it because you're scared of us? Because I was in mid-example, and so that you didn't have to listen to it, you started talking through it, so that when I finished... You didn't have to con in any way address what I said. You scared? Well, I'm, about to, I'm about to explain to you what drift is. Well, I was in the middle of asking you, after you declared that Earth is moving with a plane at the same velocity, I pointed out that that would negate the claim that Neil deGrasse Tyson's made, that Earth turns underneath 
a football to cause deflection at 15 degrees an hour. You're saying that no, wouldn't occur based on what you've just declared and now you're doing it again so that you don't have to address this, you coward? Why is it that you're interrupting the end of my declaration that you are debunking Neil deGrasse Tyson's claim? Does that require constant fundy muting, you coward? He never said that. He never said that. He said the earth turned underneath the goal to cause the ball to deflect and go through the goalposts. That's observable as what's known as Coriolis deflection. From the ground, it looked like the ball curved through the goal because earth turned underneath it. That's his claim. You're saying that's not his claim? Maybe we don't understand? Or maybe just talk through me while I make this claim that Neil deGrasse Tyson's declared quite clearly with 15 degrees now drift, that's Coriolis deflection, that you're now denying, maybe saying we don't understand with constant interruptions. Why are you so cowardly? You didn't quote him, did you? You did not quote what he said. You- it's Coriolis deflection. It's a globe claim. He's claiming it happened with a ball. I don't need to quote him. He's claiming Earth turned underneath to cause a 15 degrees an hour deflection and that would be observable from the stands as he claims earth turned under the ball now you're saying they turn together so you're debunking his claim Put him properly did you you're just talking through me so you don't have to listen to me one last chance if i see your mic moving like it is now while i'm talking i'm gonna kick you out because you're too cowardly to listen to what i'm claiming to respond to it you're just talking through me i've heard what you said no, you didn't. You talked through it. You're debunking Neil deGrasse Tyson's claim that Earth turned under the football. You're saying they turned together. That negates his claim that one drifted as one turned under the other. You're just talking through me constantly, Rumpus. You you Rumpus, you need to be removed. Point. You're not listening to me anymore. To You're just scared. I must be your nightmare. That's why you sounded so scared. That's why he sounded scared, Chocolate. Because he's terrified to listen to anything I say. He knows he's going to get pummeled. Yeah, I can tell. If he's saying Neil deGrasse Tyson did not say that, he's dead wrong. Well, I put his tweet in Master B if you want to put it on the screen. Sure. We know what Coriolis effect is. It's an effect induced by you turning underneath stuff. Now, he's saying, no, we don't understand. Yeah, we do. It's just debunked because nothing's turning underneath anything. If it was, Earth would be turning underneath a blimp. A 50-yard field goal in the University of Phoenix Stadium deflects. That's not moving together, Rumpus. Deflects. That's moving away from the second reference frame. Do you not understand what Neil deGrasse Tyson means when he says deflects? It's not moving together. That's not deflecting. Of course, he's claiming Earth turns underneath to cause this. Earth's rotation. Deflection based on Earth's rotation underneath the ball. Now, if that was the case, then a blimp filming the football game would have Earth turning underneath it. The blimp would be deflecting at the same rate he's claiming the ball deflects. Obviously, no blimp ever goes up and has earth turning underneath it. But Rumpus needs to cowardly mute everything I say, talk through every example, so that he can merely claim I'm misrepresenting Mr. deGrasse Tyson's claim. We have deflection. Well, deflection's caused, according to him, by earth turning under a football. And we have it claimed that Earth turns underneath snipers' bullets. And that Earth turns underneath gyros and pendulums. But that would also mean Earth turns under the blimp filming the game. And Earth turns underneath a helicopter. And Earth turned underneath... a I... Anything that leaves the non-inertial claim to be spinning reference frame. So you'd have flights reduced in their time because they'd be travelling west with Earth turning underneath them, exactly as claimed by Tyson. Now, you can be damn sure that Rumpus isn't going to listen to any of this. He needs to fundy mute every word of every claim that his side's making so he can convolute their claim that Earth turns underneath footballs because it would shorten flight times if it was the case and it's very easy to debunk. Much easier to say, we don't understand Neil deGrasse Tyson's claim that Earth turned under a football. That's precisely what he's claiming. It just shortens flight times if it's true. It isn't. Earth's not turning underneath anything. 
Earth is stationary. There is no deflection at 15 degrees an hour, as claimed by NDT. It would shorten flight times if there were. Nathan, would you like to hear a four or five second clip of Neil saying it? Yeah, sure. Here we go. And the angle of this, how long is it? So I checked the stadium on its configuration, what's longitude and latitude, and I said, I did a quick calculation, and I tweeted, the winning field goal in that game was aided by a one-third of an inch deflection to the right from Earth's rotation. Underneath. So it drifted to the right by observation from the stands. That's Coriolis deflection. It didn't actually drift. If you look up Coriolis definition, it's a not actual deflection. Apparent, I you can see it. Neil deGrasse Tyson thinks he can see it. So it's an apparent deflection, according to Neil deGrasse Tyson, because of Earth's rotation under the ball, causing it to appear to deflect. And if Earth's turning under the football, then it's turning under the blimp. And the blimp would drift away at 15 degrees an hour. And your flight travelling west would be shortened. For example, Charlotte, North Carolina to LA would only take an hour and a half if Earth was turning underneath it. In reality, Charlotte to LA takes four and a half hours because Earth's not turning underneath it at 15 degrees an hour, as is being claimed by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Now, because we don't see the effect, that requires Rumpus to come along and tell us that we don't understand Neil deGrasse Tyson's claim that Earth is turning underneath. Why would he defend this? Well, because he's infected with the Coriolis virus. He needs to tell us how Earth isn't turning underneath the football, precisely as claimed by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. Uh, Smoking deGrasse Tyson is in, mu in a much better place, right, than these guys, because he just ha he just gets to spout the, the rhetoric and then leave. He doesn't have to defend it to anybody. He doesn't have to debate it. These guys, unfortunately, have to. <laughs> yeah. the, the self designated guardians of their little galaxy, they have to come out and defend this nonsense and what? make themselves sound ridiculous and have to actually debunk their priest. To actually give them the story that they're here to spout at us. It's, it's the most beautiful irony. I, I love it. <laughs> it's like with the uh, pendulum when he said um, he knows all the equations, but he didn't know if it went back. But he, does, but he doesn't know how it moves. Yeah, oh, figure okay. me. No, that's a good observation, Chocolate. So the trench warfare soldiers are getting killed by the General Tyson, who says the rhetoric. And then the trench warfare guy says he never said it. And then we just play him saying it. Yeah, he puts a little battery in their back. He sends out the little toy soldiers. <laughs> the toy soldiers come in here and give us this nonsense, like, oh, uh, pendulums do figure eights and stuff like that, because I can't explain that the Earth is supposed to be rotating underneath it. Exactly. Chocolate spot on. If the guy who he was interviewing, Neil deGrasse Tyson, listened, nodded and said, all oh, right, so the ball deflected to the right because Earth turned underneath it. Wouldn't that mean that Earth was turning underneath aeroplanes and helicopters and hot air balloons, though, Mr. deGrasse Tyson? And what do you think Mr. Tyson's response is going to be? Do you think it's going to be, whatever gave you the idea that we'd see Earth turning underneath stuff, given that I've said it 15 seconds ago? Exactly. Well, Rumpus, remember, we got a Google Meet room, so there's no bull here. Boo, boo. <laughs> I'm just glad we got a full show today. Even if it crashed now, I'm quite content with an hour and three quarters of a show. That's a full show. Happy days. Did Rumpus just run off the moment he knew he wasn't going to get away with ign ignoring every question by talking through it? Just disappear. Like, sod this. He wants me to actually answer a question about Earth turning underneath. Which we don't see. Ever. Just for the record, I didn't mute him. Just ran away of his own accord. I I, I don't have Discord. Is he on Discord now? Is he self-muted? What's, what's going on? Someone no. See it? Left. Just left. Just left. Knew damn well he wasn't getting away with 
I was pointing out that he was ignoring the question by talking through it halfway through, and I continually pointed it out whilst making the point. I've become very adept at being able to make the point and point out that while they're interrupting, they're just doing it so they don't have to listen to the full rendition of the question being asked or the point being made. In that case, the point being made was he saying, no, you don't understand that they travel together. And I'm saying, well, you're debunking Neil deGrasse Tyson. No drift then. And while I'm pointing it out, he's interrupting. And I'm pointing out that he's interrupting so he doesn't have to address the fact he's just debunked Neil deGrasse Tyson. No way he's going to hang around for that, right? No, he doesn't hang around anyway. If he was interested, he'd say, all right, I'll listen to you fully. And then if you would listen to me fully, never does that. And his opener is always to come in and describe how stupid we are and then talk through anything that's debunking his own claim, i.e. him saying, no, you don't understand that there's Earth and atmosphere moving together. They're moving together. No drift, no deflection, as claimed by Neil deGrasse Tyson. I point out, well, no drift, as claimed by Neil deGrasse Tyson then. Well, you didn't quote him. You didn't listen. You haven't quoted him in full. Is what we get through the top of me explaining that, no, you saying them not drifting is them not dif drifting. It's non-deflection. And deGrasse Tyson's claiming there is deflection. You're debunking him. Well, he's not going to allow that to be heard because then seemingly he doesn't have to address it. Well, me pointing out that that's a cowardly move, obviously he's terrified. You could hear it in his voice the moment he got here. He doesn't want to be left in a position where he's going to have to have it admitted by him that no drift is no drift and DeGrasse Tyson's claiming drift. Yeah, coming into a Google Meet room with utter, utter nonsense. Yeah, baloney would have been a better pun. <laughs> oh, very good. Maybe step back to find this calculator. His calculator? Yeah, I think. I think. <laughs> <laughs> the meat jokes are never going to get old. calculator got retired. Yeah, well, if he's going to come here now with this new room, he better bring the beef because <laughs> he's got nothing. I don't think there's anybody back there. <laughs> Nobody, man. Uh, so do you like your your meeting room? Is this working good for you today? Yeah, talking of plugins, it seems that it's got a, bre a better compression system than both Skype and the old G+. So there's, I'm definitely applying less of, less fiddles to it if you want to call them that. There's less of my work having to go in after describing how much work goes in because of the room. <laughs> so I don't have to do as much, which is good. But but then again, I can tell that I don't have to do as much, which is predominantly down to the fact that I can actually hear what's going on. So can I get rid of Hangouts now? I won't need it for your show. It's not even usable anymore, unless you want to send me a message on Hangouts for some reason, no. or, or do no, an individual one-on-one no. -on -one phone call with it, which is all it's capable of now. Well, Skype does that, so... Yeah, they've, as they've soon just... as you get rid of it, they'll need it. Nah, I don't think so. I think this is what we're using now. Meat is a perfectly sufficient replacement. I actually like this better. The the layout's pretty good. Seems to work pretty well, so I'm cool. I can't see your names though. They're just off screen in a weird way. I'll have a fiddle after the fact. Once we've finished this show, I'll I'll fiddle around with meat because it is obviously usable. It's better for me because I can um I can have my phone in my pocket on my travels instead of having to keep the browser window open. Oh, it works as an app. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. It's just better, obviously. It's just superior in every way to Google Hangouts as much as we mourned it yesterday. By the way, thanks, Nan, for uh, plugging my channel and the song and the video. So I got a few subscribers from, from that. So appreciate that. Should happen again tonight. So even though it was a cut short live show, that was all full of that was part of the show. And I will add the links to your channel um, as it's you specifically that brought, you know, it's got that video on it. I'm sure there's others, but, you know, you, you come first. You're one of my panel members. So obviously I'm going to plug you over and above Spurs or whoever. As much as there's a lot of love for Spurs. I said there really wasn't on yesterday's show. We actually were quite mean to him when I listened back. Or I was. Notice how I said we. Yeah, speak for yourself, buddy. I know. You're grimy. 
You mean grimy? He's grimy. Yeah, that's what Adam said. <laughs> that's a, right, as grime a, is a, a, a fun. It's a genre. As a fun, London grime. So some of his lyrics were pretty, pretty <laughs> serious. So, yep. I, I would in New York. You could call him a little grimy. Yeah, I would say that. <laughs> yeah, it's more more white rabbit than London grime, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah, Spur, shout out to Spurs, man. He did his thing on that. Shout out to everybody. I forgot that. To... that was his ace. No, it was Adam saying his his wife was listening to it. He says, "But that guy, he's a bit grimy." <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's some of the things that we hear from the English. The way you guys talk make us laugh too. You know. I'm sure you do have grime over there. It's just a genre. Grime is yeah. a compliment in street when you're rhyming. Exactly, you're, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> you, you, you're rhyming with griming? Rhyming with griming. Look, us old fuddy-duddies talking about grime is just letting the whole stank of the situation out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> that limey is grimy. <laughs> we call the shows descending already. <laughs> oh, too funny, man. No, it's good. I mean, Spurs yeah. chemo, the grimy limey. <laughs> we, we goes, <laughs> grimy limey. There it goes. <laughs> no, we got South Africa. We got England. We got America. We got Australia. We got people all over the world on the show. It's fun. That's, that limey comment is actually show related in a scientific context. Fade Ow. off scurvy. That's why we get called limeys. Really? Yeah. So to, to hmm. obviously that's a something we use as an example of a, a validated scientific experiment or validated hypothesis. Should, I should say. Well, the effect of vitamin C negating scurvy is the reason they carried limes on the ships. Got the nickname limeys. Well, they've all got limes. Why? Well, they didn't want to get scurvy. You learn something new every day on Flat Earth Debate. I remember, I remember watching a little film in school about that, how all the sailors would come back and they couldn't figure out what was going on with them and they figured out they, they needed vitamin C. Figured out? No, validated scientifically. Exactly. Well, I didn't want to put Hey, they also took just... um, those British troops, also took oh, um, whining. Up. They got it from the same area in Peru. Uh, that's where quinine is from. Right. It's in tonic water. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. The rich people drink uh, to uh, gin and tonic. That's not with the lime. rich people drink. With, with lime. <laughs> exactly. And the capital of uh, Peru is Lima. How do you say Do you say quinine? We say quinine. Quinine mm. here. Quinine. Okay. Yeah. Quinine. English. Yeah, I heard this from um on the Alex Jones show. I guess I could post it in the chat, but get yeah, out. He talks about get out. Only Arwin is allowed to like Alex Jones. Just a, an in joke. I'm only kidding. <laughs> I really don't Jones. like him either, but um, <laughs> yeah, he did pass this fun fact on to a lot of people. Until what? Nathan's room treatment matches Alex Jones, don't bring it up again. Uh, well, <laughs> it does actually match Joe Rogan's. Joe Rogan's acoustic treatment is also GIK. <laughs> Just out of a <laughs> Everyone hates it, though. They're all like, it looks like a toaster. <laughs> <laughs> he's, got, he's got the braids pattern. I went with uh, 3D cubes. One of the patterns is braids, but he's put them sideways. And I've got to admit, it does look like a toaster. Because where I've got mine black fabric, he's got red fabric with braids sideways so it does look like a toaster element <laughs> inside the new joe rogan studio and it's a wicked studio i mean it's absolutely ace you know i would most people would kill to have a studio like that. it's epic i've seen the design and the build of it it's just amazing but then like i say one little error with the wrong color fabric and the wrong pattern on the front and he looks like he's in a toaster <laughs> that's where that phrase comes in one little error in your toast 
Because I, I, I did quite like that after the fact. I was like, you know, you, you pick a, a particular brand and there's loads of different treatment brands to pick. And I picked JRK because I like the patterns. Simple as that. I like the look of them. I asked my wife, which pattern do you like? She said, I like the cubes. I was like, I like the cubes. Let's have that. It looks nice. Most of the stuff, you can either have one of three things. You can either have it cheap, effective, or pretty. But you can only have two. So it can't be effective, pretty, and cheap. It can be cheap and effective, but bags of hessian stuffed with building insulation will do the same job, but it'll look horrendous. You know, so therefore you've got to spend decent money on it. So to know that someone like Joe Rogan, who essentially, as compared to me, has got an infinite budget, you can just buy all of it at once, right? He's not buying it piecemeal one or two panels a month. He's just ordered everything he needs and stuck it in. But it's just nice to know that somebody who's got, well, I've got budget to do anything with my acoustic treatment. He's bought the same as I have, which makes me feel quite a little bit more confident about it. Like I know it's good stuff. Other people who are more reputable than I have bought it, i.e. Joe Rogan. Other than the fact his looks like a toaster, it's very good. No, I think it's good because it's not a mechanical thing. It's not like it's going to break and you can take it if you move, it's going to be with you the rest of your life as your show grows. Exactly. One of the selling points they do actually promote about it. Might as well plug my GoFundMe. Go and check out my GoFundMe. <laughs> keep plugging, keep plugging. So, Nathan, tomorrow, as all the Americans are celebrating Thanksgiving, you just don't have that holiday, correct? I, I didn't even know it was Thanksgiving tomorrow, but yes, we don't have that holiday. Yeah, it's an American holiday for sure. But uh, I know all, that. But but people all over the world. Well, let me finish. People all over the world still like to uh, eat turkey, so they celebrate it anyway, just to eat turkey. Well, this part of the show goes out tomorrow on Nathan Oakley channel. So, have you got any Thanksgiving well wishes for me to round out my show with? No, I was yeah. just going to say that the Irish guys I work with, they um. They look for any excuse to drink, so <laughs> they used to celebrate Thanksgiving. Well, we give you all permission yeah. if you're watching this now. Flat Earth celebrate Debate gives you all permission to raise a glass on Thanksgiving. Anything else? Yeah, I want to give Happy thanks. Gobble, gobble, uh, to... Happy Gobble Gobble Day. Happy Gobble Gobble? Gobble, yes. Any more? No, any more for any more? Any more Thanksgiving wishes? Yeah. yeah, I want to give thanks for my friends here on the panel and the good fight that we put up every day for the nature of this surf. Perfect. With that, I'm going to say a huge, massive, enormous thank you to both <sighs> Meet and Discord panel for making today's after show possible. Of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Pro Ring streams for hopefully smashing the super chat, hitting the GoFundMe, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, and all that good stuff. Be sure to check out NathanOakley.com and the Flat Earth Debate Forum to keep up to date with the community debate. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I'll see you all in the next video.